Hey everyone, welcome back to Adhere to Apologetics. I'm so pumped to join us today. Today we're back from a few months of a break, and today I'm with the Dr. Graham Oppie. Um, he's a professor of philosophy at Monash down in Australia. He's the foundational editor of the Australian Philosophical Review, um, and he's organizing the 25th World Congress of Philosophy good down in Melbourne in July. Um, he's known for all kinds of things, and today we're going to be talking about um, arguments from reason, especially like anti-naturalistic arguments for reason. Graham, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I should correct one thing in what you just said, though. So this mm. this news apparently hasn't gotten out everywhere, but the decision was made not to do the World Congress in Australia. That happened when COVID happened. It was supposed to happen this year, and there was just no way that we could get it organised. So it's actually now happening in Rome, and I'm not involved in the organisation. So I should correct that point. Mm, bummer, bummer. Well, are you are you going at least? Um, probably not. I'm not traveling much these days. So, yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, today we're going to be talking about your work in like the argument from reason. Obviously, like you're a very like um, well known for all kinds of things, like the best argument against God and like um, theory comparison and all that stuff. Um, but today we're going to kind of like dive into arguments from reason in a paper you wrote uh back in it was published in 2022 about it um so yeah do you want to have do you have any like preliminary thoughts or anything graham before we kind of dive into these different arguments sure so there's some discussion of arguments from reason in my old book arguing about gods so in that book there's a discussion for example of um richard taylor's argument from reason uh but apart from that this was a relatively new topic. I hadn't looked into the sort of history of discussions of what you might think of as arguments from reason. Arguments By arguments from reason, I mean arguments against naturalism or naturalistic um, or sort of evolutionary naturalism, naturalism conjoined with evolutionary theory. Um, so arguments against it, which claim that somehow or other uh, considerations about reason defeat those theories probably in most cases because they somehow it, it somehow turns out to be self-defeating like you end up if you if you commit yourself to naturalism and evolutionary theory then you just don't have a good reason to do that or it's sort of somehow by the lights of reason it's self-defeating for you to do that or something along those lines and there have been thoughts in that ballpark for a long time and the first within 20 or 30 years of Darwin's publishing of The Origin of Species, there were people making these kinds of observations and there have been people right up to the present who've continued to make them. And uh, what I thought I would do in the article is just have a look at some of the people who've made those kinds of claims and the kinds of arguments that they make. Um, and it was kind of a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we're going to do for people listening, um, what you're going to hear in the next hour or so is we're going to go through these different arguments. Um, Graham's going to kind of like frame the argument and kind of just give, give his thoughts of like, maybe like, here's the strength of the argument and here's maybe where like the argument falls short. Um, and we're going to get rolling. So the first person, I believe, um, the last name is Balfour, and I believe you're talking about Arthur Balfour um, from Scotland in the late 1800s, I think. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about like well, what this argument is, and then maybe like give some of maybe like a strength, and like maybe give some pushback on your thoughts on the argument? So um, Balfour was a significant um, public figure in the UK. He wasn't primarily known as an academic philosopher, but he was a philosopher, and he published a bunch of books um, that were philosophical and in several of them he ran this kind of argument where he argued that um, if you um, arrived at a position of um, essentially a kind of evolutionary naturalism um, on the basis of holding certain kinds of um, uh, fundamental beliefs and maybe those the, the kind of the evolution and the naturalism were part of the, fund, the fundamental beliefs. Uh, on the basis of that, you would reach the conclusion that all beliefs are doubtful. 
And so the idea was you have these ultimate beliefs which have to be certain in order to be um, ultimate. And from them, you infer that everything, including those beliefs, um, are not certain. And he thought that that was just outrageously inconsistent. And the conclusion that he wanted to draw was that the thing that was going wrong was supposing that evolutionary naturalism was correct. Mm. Okay, so does that sound sort of familiar? That's the that's the that's the Belfer position. Mm -hmm. right. Now, um, what should we make of this? Well, it's not exactly clear what we should mean by it ultimate beliefs. But one thing would be this. Consider all the beliefs that you've got and imagine that you've got access to some kind of super um, advisor who can give you a nice, neat axiomatization of your beliefs. So um, from a small set of your beliefs, all the rest of them follow by logical consequence. Right? And then in a certain sense, now it makes sense to say that the axioms are your ultimate beliefs. Should you think that your axioms are certain, should you give probability one to all of them? Well, no, that would be absurd because then it would follow that you'd give, because your everything else is logical consequences of those, that you'd be giving probability one to all of your beliefs. But nobody thinks that all of their beliefs are certain. So if that's the way that we're understanding ultimate beliefs, it's just not true that you should take them to be certain. Right. So that's the, that's the kind of straight off objection to um, Balfour. Now, he, he might have some other way of determining what the ultimate beliefs are. But it seems to me that if, if there's some sense in which the, the ultimate beliefs are going to generate all the rest of them, you better not think that they're all certain um, unless you can kind of establish that certainty doesn't transmit from the ultimate beliefs to the others. Otherwise, it's just sort of obvious that there isn't um, a problem of the kind that he imagines because you just can't think that your ultimate beliefs are certain without mm. running into absurdity. Okay, so that was that's, I think, Belfer's argument and what's wrong with it. It might not be exactly a perfect interpretation of Balfour, I'm not sure. Okay, so, so the other thing to note um, is that, and this is a point that we'll come back to probably, uh, there's no difficulty in supposing that your um, ultimate beliefs are not certain. You might have thought there was, because you might sort of think like this. If... Suppose you give some probability like 0.8 to each of your ultimate beliefs, then um, so long as you've got quite a lot of them, you'll end up in the position of thinking that a great many of your ultimate beliefs, it's very likely that a great many, maybe even most of your ultimate beliefs are false. For each one of them individually, you'll believe it, but you'll also believe that it's very likely that their conjunction, right, taking them together, isn't true. And you might worry that that looks self-defeating, but it really isn't, right? It really isn't. It's just a, the product of not being a dogmatist, of not being certain about everything, that you have to admit that even though, by your lights, each of these individual beliefs looks credible enough, it's at least the probability is at least greater than 0.5, when you join them all together, it's overwhelmingly likely that there's errors in there somewhere. This is sort of related to the, um, to move to a different context, to the paradox of the preface. You know, you write a book um, which has got millions of claims in it um, and you say there's probably a mistake in there somewhere, right? Um, and even though you stand behind the book, right, each one of the claims individually seems right to you you're not going to be very confident that it's all right, right? And this is just a, a kind of instance of that sort of thought applied in this case. Mm -hmm. So so, so there are kind of two points, parts to the reply to Belfer. I mean, there's a kind of independent reason why you don't want to think that all of the ultimate beliefs, whatever those are, are certain. And there's no problem 
that arises, even though if you give up the idea that your fundamental beliefs are certain, you're going to have to admit that um, it's pretty likely that you've got errors, right? But that's just a sensible mm -hmm. fallibilism. There's nothing dramatic about that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is helpful. So we have Balfour um, coming from, like, Scotland in the late 1800s, I believe it was Scotland, saying that, like, ultimate beliefs um, – just can't come from like an uncertain process like evolution where there's like, we, we don't really know what would happen. Um, and that's his gist. And you're just trying to, a couple ways you can push back is just saying that like, well, Hey, first, um, if we have an ultimate belief of the probability of one, then like everything else is going to follow and everything's necessary or like um, that all follows. We don't want that. And you also want to say like, Hey, we don't need to have like a probability of like one about like our ultimate belief about like how um, we came about or something like that. Right, so the problem's going to be if you start with certainty and you infer by a certain method, which logical consequence, right, taking logical consequence is certain, the certainty is going to transmit to the consequent, right? And so mm -hmm. if all of your beliefs are in uh, logical consequence, are either of ultimate beliefs or logical consequences of them, it's going to turn out that every belief is certain. And nobody thinks that right you believe your football team's going to win next week but you shouldn't be certain about it right mm -hmm. whatever right i mean that's a silly example but you can there's all kinds of cases where you've you you've got you you give a kind of decent probability to a claim enough that we would say well you believe it but not enough to say that you're certain mm -hmm. okay yeah that's really helpful um and we're going to keep going through the timeline so now we're looking at um another philosopher named haldane um, is his last name, and he's writing in 1929. Um, what's Haldane's take on the argument from reason? As you start, I'm going to run out really quickly. So, um, so Haldane's actually a biologist rather than a philosopher. I mean, he wrote he wrote popular um, works in biology, and there's a kind of there's some philosophical content in there. What he worries about, and this is it's not really clear that Haldane should be in this list um, of people. Um, but what he worries about is the thought that if you're um, a certain kind, if you have a certain kind of philosophical position, you might think that um, your beliefs and your reasoning ultimately are just kind of determined by what's going on in the microphysical domain, right? So that um, there's, there's kind of causal processes happening at the micro domain and they, de and they determine the facts about what you believe at any point in time. And he thinks that that, that kind of picture undermines the idea that, um, that you reason for example, because the transition between the states is just determined by the microphysical laws and reason doesn't enter the picture at all. So he talks about uh, determination by motion of atoms and he's, he's thinking that there's something wrong with that picture, the picture that has um, your... Um, the, the facts, microphysical facts being determined by microphysical facts or claims about um, macrophysical properties being determined by facts about microphysical properties. Now, I just agree with Haldane that you don't want to be a reductionist in that sense, but that's not um, inconsistent with being an evolutionary naturalist. Right. And so maybe at this point we need to kind of define some terms. But uh, I, so what I'm going to say is um, that Haldane's right to object to a certain way of thinking about things, but uh, that way of thinking about things is just not obligatory for evolutionary naturalists. So what I'm thinking that naturalists think is something like this. Um, there's two bits to naturalism. One bit is that um, there are 
all of all of the causal entities that there are and natural entities and all the causal properties that there are are natural properties and the natural properties are just and the natural entities are just the properties and entities that are amenable to study by the sciences very broadly construed right so the sciences i don't just mean formal sciences and physical sciences i mean the social sciences as well right um so that's what I mean by naturalism. And if that's what you mean by naturalism, and you, you, you're not thinking of something much more specific, like a kind of microphysicalism, which says that the only causal entities that there are are microphysical causal entities, and the only, um, the only sort of causal properties that there are are microphysical causal properties. You're not thinking that, but you're thinking in this more general way. Then um, the kind of picture that um, Haldane was arguing against is obviously not obligatory. Uh, so there's something else to, to think about at this point, but maybe I should pause in case you've got questions about what I said so far. So if I'm just, I want to just kind of like highlight these arguments for everyone listening. What Haldane is trying to get at is he's saying that like um, he's viewing the world as like saying with his argument, like, hey, if you're going to say there's like this microphysical structure um, where maybe like one thing causes another, um, then if that's the case, um, that causes your beliefs to happen, this like microphysical structure. And if that's the case, like there's no reason for like believing what you are because you're just like kind of following like whatever, like however the atoms are like pushing or whatnot. Right. So it seems that reason just disappears out of the picture. There's just this causation by microphysical um, particles, but it's kind of self-defeating if we're thinking of ourselves as trying to reason about what the world's like to adopt mm -hmm. that picture because it feels like we've just now pulled the rug out from underneath ourselves. And yeah, okay. So that's, that's I think, what's going on. Uh, and it's not that Haldane's a biologist and he believes in evolution and he's a naturalist in some sense. He's just not a kind of microphysical reductionist that's what mm -hmm. he's arguing against okay. and it, it seems to me that um that really doesn't put what he's saying in the same ballpark as the other arguments that we're mm. that we're looking at okay yeah, yeah that'll, that's that'll be one that'll be one way of saying it yeah Okay, yeah. So you're, it's kind of like, hey, like, like this isn't like really a theistic argument. It's just an argument against a specific model of like, a, like an atheistic, like naturalistic view. Yeah, that's correct. All right, and, well, and, and it's a view that lots of people would have maintained, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a, it's a, a straw man that he's attacking. Yeah. Okay, well, let's keep on rolling because we're gonna go through nine philosophers um, or scientists or whatnot here in different like arguments here. Um, let's look at next is coming from Joad, and I believe we're talking about CEM Joad um, up in England. Um, what's his argument and like what's your take on it, Graham? So, so Joad's kind of interesting. He um, for a period of his career he was an atheist, but he re he sort of I think he converted from Christianity to atheism and then much later in life, he reconverted to Christianity. And um, the, I forget the year, I, I can look it up, the, the 1933 book. So it's kind of mid career. And I think it's at, at the point in his career where he's, a, he's an atheist. Uh, he has an objection to, behavioristic psychology he thinks that it's self undermining right and um, the it's not exactly clear what from from the the text that i read how he was thinking about behavioristic psychology but if you think of behavioristic psych psychology as being committed to doing empirical research into psychology so you, trying to use um, experimental techniques, laboratory techniques and um, sort of social scientific observation techniques and so on in order to collect data for social psychology. It's unclear how you could think that that was self-undermining. On the other hand, if you had a 
view that what behavioristic psychology said was something like um, that um, all the all the data that you can appeal to in psychology is behavioristic data and you can't it, you know that it's either there isn't anything um, mental right there are no beliefs desires and so on or that you just can't appeal to them when you're doing psychological explanation then that seems to me to put restrictions on psychology that are kind of untenable right so again here this is not a an objection really to the combination of naturalism and evolutionary theory it's an objection to a particular way a, a particular approach to psychology which many people back then who were naturalists and evolutionary theorists might have thought was looked attractive uh, but Joad thought that it was self-defeating and I think even if it's not exactly self-defeating it's obviously not the best approach to take to psychology so again um, I don't think that there's anything here that speaks in any direct way to atheism you know to questions about God and I'm kind of sympathetic to the, the broad view that Jode's expressing Okay, so Joe thinks that, like, if behavior psychologist is true, psychologist is true, it's self defeating. Um, why is like I was just, that was a little unclear about why exactly is that? Like, why does he think that? So, um, I thought that it wasn't very clear. So, what he actually says is, if the conclusions of behavioristic psychology are correct there's no reason to believe them or to think that they're true right and so what might be going on is that um, the behaviorists tried to do without talk about thought and belief right they weren't worried about i mean and in, in, in some sense maybe they denied um inner causes right they just thought that psychology should be focused on um behavior mm -hmm. right? that was the and um maybe they would let you talk about dispositions to behave maybe although if you read people like watson and skinner it's not clear that they wanted to even to do that much but jode was worried about the this this sort of question should you believe um behavioristic psychology and he thought that if behavioristic psychology just trashed the notion of belief then it's kind of incoherent to think that you should believe it so i think there's something like that going on in his work and um i'm not sure that um putting it that way exactly will stand up to scrutiny but i do think that you end up with of kind of very impoverished psychology if you're not going to allow yourself to talk about beliefs and desires and things like that and somehow or other connect um, the findings in your psychology to our everyday ways of understanding ourselves and our actions and so on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's keep going. So the next person, um, some people may know who this is, um, C.S. Lewis, um, in 1947 has his version of the argument from reason – what does Lewis say? And like, what are your thoughts, Graham? So he thinks that if you accept, so this, so this is kind of the, the early version of this, because this is an argument that he returned to um, at several times over the course of his career. Um, if you think of um, evolutionary naturalism, as, as a kind of system of thought, then he thought it's a commitment of that view that thoughts result from irrational causes. They don't have any rational causes because their causes are kind of, I mean, take the physicalist version, 
merely somehow or other aggregates of physical stuff, right? And so, so he argued that there was something self-defeating about this because, of course, um, on, on any ordinary understanding, um, thought and reason are closely connected. You have, have beliefs for reasons. And if the causes of beliefs were irrational, that would just defeat the idea that you had beliefs for reasons. Mm. Right. So that was that was the kind of early version of the argument. Uh, this version of the argument was attacked quite strongly by the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. And at the time that she... Um, made her attack on Lewis's argument, Lewis was pretty quickly convinced that she was right. And he was, um, and the point that she made was that the causes aren't irrational, right? They're just non-rational. Mm. And so, uh, or one of the points that she made was that it's just a mistake to talk about irrationality here. It's not like um, when a rock falls, there's something irrational about the rock, right? Rock, rocks just aren't the kinds of things that have reason. Uh, and so the right thing to do, say, would be that rationality just doesn't apply. If you want to say anything, you're not going to say that rocks are irrational. You're going to say that they're non-rational. They just don't fall inside the scope of reason. The more that that's not the kind of most interesting thing to say in response to Lewis, I think. So you can see what Lewis is doing here as in some ways being similar to what some of the other pe earlier people that we've talked about were thinking. He's thinking that somehow or other, if you have this picture, um, re reductionistic picture, and you think that you know, I mean, to put it put it this way, there's nothing but atoms in the void, right? Then it's hard to see how reason could get into that picture at all. If you think that there's just um, physical, biological systems evolving over time, and there's a whole lot of just physical causation going on, how could reason ever enter the picture? That's what he's worrying about. Um, and I think that in the end, that way of thinking is um, depending on the idea that there's some sort of, there's, there's something about evolutionary naturalism that's reductive. So that um, things, at, so there's kind of levels in reality and things at higher levels get fully explained by things at lower levels. And if you kind of look down to one of the, to the really low level where there's just whatever physics says the basic constituents are, strings or quantum fields or whatever, that level is completely non-rational. So how could rationality ever get into the picture? Right. Now, there are different ways that you might try and respond to this, but the way that I want to respond to it is by just is by rejecting the idea that you've got um, sort of this determination from the lower level to higher levels, and I think that uh, it, in a certain sense it's true that there are levels, right? There are different energy levels. You can probe the universe at, at different energy levels, and you'll see different things. If you look at the say at the level of quarks, right? You're not going to see um, atoms or molecules or anything bigger than that, right, at, at that level. If you look at the level of atoms, so you see atoms, you won't see the lower level things, but you still won't see people and stars and galaxies and so on. Um, if you kind of probe at the kind of level that we exist at, um, and I should say that um, energy and length are kind of directly connected here. So we can think of length scale as an, an 
or energy level is the, th the thing that we're probing at. You'll see different things. Now, some people want to think so th that the bottom level is um, uh, sort of fundamental. That's really where the action happens, the causal action and so on. And what happens at higher levels is sort of in somehow derivative. It's either determined or, um, or, or, or something like that. Um, I think that the relation between levels is not a determination relation. And I think that at each level, there's a kind of vocabulary that's appropriate to describing that level. And you can't reduce in either direction. You can't take what's true at higher levels and apply it to the lower level. And you can't take and you can't take what's true at lower levels and give a complete description of higher levels in terms of it either. So what's being, what I want to reject is the reductionistic thought. Now, um, go to the level that we exist at and um, consider how, how to describe us. Um, we have beliefs, desires, intentions, we reason and so on. I'm going to take it, these things for granted. What's, what are our beliefs, desires, intentions and so on? Well, I'm going to say that and, and our reasoning that what we're talking about is um, states and processes that are, I mean, as a first approximation, neural states and processes that have appropriate evolutionary and social histories and are appropriately embedded in the environments in which they're in. And then on this way of thinking about things, natural, the, natu the evolutionary naturalists have a very direct response to Lewis or anything like that. Um, the beliefs have reasons. There are, you know, the reasons for believing things might be other beliefs or they might be environmental, you know, inputs or whatever, um, it turns out uh, that our beliefs are um, crudely, because the long story which I just gave you is, um, is too hard to repeat, um, just neural states and processes. And there are reasons, right? They're just part of the story. So there's nothing in evolutionary naturalism that leads you to deny that um, thoughts have rational causes. Mm -hmm. They do. Beliefs, and design, beliefs in particular have rational causes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Okay. Which, which, which kind of just fits with our ordinary picture of the world. Right. So what's, what's going on here, the kind of important move that I'm making, is that at the... At, at the kind of scale that we exist at, I'm an identity theorist right, mm -hmm. about, about beliefs, desires, thoughts, and so on. I think that we can identify those things with neural states and processes, and there can be um, rational relations between them. Right? They don't have to be, but they can be. Okay. And, and there can be causal relations too, um, it's just that some of the sometimes there are there are there are rational relations, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if things are going well, lots of the time there will be. Yeah. So Lewis is kind of thinking that a fundamental like quarks, atoms, like whatever it is, that kind of causing our thought process in some sense is going to make us like irrational in what we're concluding. Um, non, non, you are... non, non rational, non rational. All right. I mean, he okay. says irrational, but under pressure from Anscombe, he recognizes that he shouldn't have said that. Okay. Right. He should, he should have said non rational. Okay. A non rational process, then. Uh, my apologies. Um, and that's not going to work. And you're saying, well, like, that's not always the case um, because of like identity theory and things like this. Right. So that's the, the, the kind of primary component here is going to be um, identity theory. But I'm resisting the kind of reductionistic bit because I agree that if you kind of look down there amongst the quarks, you're not going to find rationality down there. And if you insist that that's where you have to find it, you're going to be disappointed. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's super helpful, Graham. Um, we're going to keep on rolling and this is our halfway point. Um, so get excited. We have Richard Taylor. Now we're crossing over to the United States. Um, what does he say about the argument from reason and kind of like, what are your thoughts, Graham? So he has a very distinctive argument. He thinks of it as a design argument. So okay. he imagines, um, imagine that you're on a train reaching the border between Wales and England. And there's a sign that says British Railways welcomes you to Wales, um, made out of rocks on the side of a hill. Mm -hmm. What you're going to think is that there, he says, is that somebody put those rocks there deliberately in order to make them spell out the message, British Railways welcomes you to Wales. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a kind of informational content there that requires explanation. And the obvious um, thing to do, the explaining, is to appeal to intentional agents. And then he says, but we think that our sense organs are guides to truth. Um, and so we can't think of them as just products of evolution. We have to think that they were designed by an intentional agent because the reasoning that applied in the case of the sign British Railways welcomes you to Wales applies in equal measure to your, say, your visual faculty. So that's the, um, the argument. Right. Now, I think this, is, this argument just relies on a really crude error. Right. So, I mean, I agree that in the... In the case of the sign, in order to take what you see as evidence, right, in order to take the words on the sign, British Railways welcomes you to Wales, as evidence that you're about to go over the border, you pretty much have to think that there was someone who wrote the words on the sign, intending that that was the message that would be conveyed. Mm -hmm. But when you think about, say, your visual faculty, right, we're not, there's something quite different going on. What we're relying on from our visual faculty is that when, um, when we seem to see things, things are as they appear to us, as, you know, things are as they seem to be visually. Right. So we're thinking of our senses as reliable conduits of information, right? So if there's a tree I'm in my backyard, I'm going to see it when I look. And that's, it's not that our sense organs are evidence for anything, right? So the point about the sign was in order for it to be evidence for the claim, it had to have been that there was someone who designed the you know, deliberately put the rocks into that formation. But in order for our senses to be reliable conduits of information, we don't need designers in who've, um, you know, <laughs> somehow or other, what exactly, put them together to represent certain, right? I mean, there isn't even an analogy here. And uh, the other point is that, there's a perfectly good explanation from the standpoint of evolutionary theory about the reliability of our senses, right? There's a very straightforward argument. If you think about the kind of, uh, think about it in the kind of um, fairly orthodox evolutionary theory, theoretical terms, right? If you've got two critters and one of them's doing a bit better at reliably representing its environment. For example, it's a bit better at reliably representing when there are predators around. Then over time, the critters that have got the more reliable representation of when there are predators around will prosper and the other ones will disappear from the evolutionary record. Right. So there's a kind of arms race here that inevitably is going to, over time, lead to reasonably reliable representation of the environment over a range of things that are um, what that selection is going to operate upon. Right? So you would expect um, vision not to represent things that 
aren't there, right? <laughs> like imagining, you know, representing trees where there are no trees so that you're dodging around them is just wasting energy. On the other hand, failing to represent trees when there are trees there and you just run into them and you kind of knock yourself out and get captured by a predator, that's a disaster too. So you're going to expect reliable representation of trees in um, organisms of the kind of size that we're at uh, uh, if you're given um, sufficient, you know, evolutionary history and so on. So the reliability of our, say, a a visual sense or our auditory sense or whatever is something that actually is going to be well explained by um, evolutionary theory, but in a way that completely undermines the idea that there's some analogy between the sign on the Welsh border and our senses. Right. So mm. that's my reply to Taylor. So that's more or less the reply that I gave in arguing about gods. And I still think that that reply is kind of correct. Yeah, that's interesting. I think with Taylor, it's kind of might be a little bit difficult to get your mind around it just because arguments from analogy are a little different. Um, but I think it's helpful to see, like, from your view, Graham, how you're thinking, like, with evolutionary theory, like, there is, like, a good explanation of, like, how um, you could come to gradually have, like, rational capacities because of, like, survival and things like that. So, yeah, that's helpful. Um, let's keep rolling. So our next person... Um, we're looking at 1987 J.P. Moreland, um, who I'm sure many people are familiar with if you're listening to a podcast like this. Um, what's J.P. Moreland's argument from reason and what are your thoughts on it? So in a way, I kind of discuss what I think is wrong with Moreland's uh, argument. So the kind of key thing he says is that accurate information is not necessary to survival, right? So that is that you, you, you shouldn't expect that there's no reason to expect that over time creatures are going to get more and more accurate at representing their environments. And, you know, he imagines these kind of fanciful examples, something that kind of misrepresents big things as small and small things as big. And he says that that needn't make any difference to their um, prospects of survival. Um, and, that seems really weird, right? I mean, suppose that, so, you know, you've got a tiger detector, but you systematically misrepresent um, two-month-old tiger cubs as hu huge and adult tigers as tiny so that you run away from the tiger cubs, but you just sit there doing nothing when the adult tigers come. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that that's not going to be good for you. <laughs> chances of reproducing mm -hmm. right? so it, it's just so so i don't really think there's anything sort of more to add um in connection with the moorland article right it's yeah. it's obviously not true that we shouldn't expect that over um biological time creatures are going to get better at representing their environments and that clearly has happened. Um, if you look at, for example, um, two things, the kind of the development of eyes and the associated kind of increase in brain size that's associated with visual processing. Over historical time, there's a hu huge amount of development, right, in a kind of fairly linear way. Um, of more acute, more accurate visual processing, right? That's just driven by evolution, right? So anyway, that's... Mm. So Moreland, his, like, contribution here is your, is the idea that, like, he wants to say that, like, accurate information um, is not necessarily needed for survival. Um, yeah. And your reply is, well, like, a lot of the times it is. Like, if you're thinking about, like, a tiger, like, it's, it'd be important to perceive, like, a large tiger that could, like, kill you versus, like, a little baby tiger um, that might not that, that might not harm you. So, Well, yeah. it's important to understand what we mean by survival here. So, I mean, I'm not talking about the survival of an individual animal. I'm talking about what, what you would expect to see in populations over time, what kinds of traits you would set, expect to see persisting or developing. And what, you, what you're going to see 
developing over time in any species um, that survives over time is going to be some um, improvement in the accuracy of the information, right? So if you think about us and think about our ancestors at the time of the, uh, say, the time of the dinosaurs, right? Um, our our um, sensory processing, say, for um, vision, very, very likely, I mean, we have to go and check the biological <laughs> textbooks to make sure I'm not getting this wrong, but it's very likely that there are improvements in our vision over that period of time, over those tiny mammals that were our ancestors 65 million years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and okay. that would be entirely predictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, so we looked at J.P. Moreland. Um, now there's Alvin Plantinga, which in your paper, like, goodness gracious, you have, like a whole paragraph of like citations of all the people that have like been like building and criticizing and all these things. Um, what's what's Plantinga's argument? And like, what do you think of it, Graham? Okay, so planting is um, argument against evolutionary naturalism is quite complicated. Um, in the most recent presentations of it, he gives two versions. There's a kind of particular version that sort of applies to um, metaphysical beliefs or um, philosophical beliefs. And then there's a kind of more general one that just applies to believing in general. And I think that it's, so what I, what I did in this paper is I just discussed the application to metaphysical and philosophical reasoning. And I'll stick with that in the talk, but it does mean that this is not a complete discussion of what, um, of, of planting is some evolutionary argument against naturalism, right? It's not, um, it's not, a, it's not going to be complete. So Plantinga argues, I mean, the kind of heart of um, Plantinga's argument is that um, there's a question about the reliability of our believing. So uh, what he wants to say is that the probability that we're reliable in our metaphysical believing, given both naturalism and evolutionary theory. So supposing that evolutionary naturalism is correct, the probability that we're reliable at metaphysics is very low. And that means that because, you know, evolutionary naturalism is a kind of metaphysical belief, it's sort of self-defeating because you end up if you think that the probability that we're reliable is very low, then you're going to think that the probability that you're getting that particular belief right is, this seems to be how it goes, the probability that you're getting that particular belief right has to be very low, but then you were supposed to be believing it right. So somehow or other, where it, it's, it goes right back to the some of the others that we've been talking about, you kind of pulling the rug out from underneath yourself or soaring off the branch on which you're sitting or whatever by um, accepting um, both naturalism and evolutionary theory because um, that commits you to thinking that your belief in naturalism and evolutionary theory um, has very low probability. Mm. Right, now, uh, there are various reasons why I think this isn't right the and i touched on some of them much earlier on the important point is that actually it's just independently plausible no matter what you believe pretty much that the probability that we're reliable at metaphysics is close to zero it's very very low right the uh, the evidence for this is just that amongst philosophers, there's widespread disagreement on pretty much every question in metaphysics. So uh, 
pick, pick almost any topic, other abstract objects, there, and you look at um, what, and we'll just restrict our attention to Christian theists, there's 50 different views that Christian theists have about the topic of whether there are abstract objects. Mm. At most, one of them is true. So the probability that we're reliable, because reliability means that in this discussion, reliability means good at hitting the truth, right? The idea that we're good at hitting the truth there is, right, sort of, I mean, it's obvious that we're not, right, when there's 50 different views and only one of them can be true and we have a distribution pretty even over it. And the same is true for all the other topics in metaphysics. So I say, given how we're thinking about reliability here, that when we form beliefs in this field, proportionately, we mostly hit the truth. The idea that we're reliable in metaphysics is absurd, right? So the probability that we're reliable at metaphysics, full stop, is close to zero. Mm. Now, supposing that um, we're, you know, naturalism, evolutionary theory or whatever, and we conditionalise reliability on that and it comes out low, that's a positive, right? Because we're getting the right answer. We're getting the answer that we're, that we're not reliable with respect to those things. So there can hardly be an objection to um, naturalism and the combination of naturalism and evolutionary theory that starts from the idea that the probability that we're reliable with respect to metaphysics, given those things, is low, right? So, the, so I say there's obviously something wrong with planting his argument at this point. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing that I want to say is that it's not self-defeating to suppose that we're unreliable at metaphysics and yet go on holding metaphysical beliefs. Right? So the reason for this is that so long as, I mean, and this is, this goes back to the thing I said earlier about the paradox of the preface. So long as you don't give absurdly high probability to your metaphysical beliefs in general, like, you know, you hold all of your metaphysical beliefs with probability 0.99999 or something like that. So you're more or less certain about everything. When you, so long as you've got, as, we, as philosophers do, you have lots and lots of different metaphysical beliefs and then you consider what's the probability that they're all true or that most of them are true it will turn out to be very low essentially because they're kind of independent beliefs i'm going to imagine you know you've got a thousand different metaphysical axioms and each of them's probability 0.9 the probability that all of them are true is 0.9 to the power of thousand which is vanishingly small and if you do the calculation the probability that 80% of them are true, will also be vanishingly small. So the probability that most of your beliefs are true will be tiny, right? Mm -hmm. And that would that you and if you look at the numbers and you play around with it a bit, you can see that you can have reasonably strong metaphysical beliefs. You could have, I mean, you could be certain about some of them, like you could be certain about um, naturalism and evolutionary theory. Right, and then be uns and then have sort of credence 0 0.7 for lots of other things, and there'll be nothing inconsistent in your um, maintaining that most of your metaphysical beliefs are false. Right. Okay, right. Yeah. So, right, that's that's just that just falls out of the mathematics of probability, right? So the idea that there was a potential defeater here for your belief was also mistaken, which is just as well given the fact that we're definitely unreliable with respect to metaphysics, because otherwise we should stop doing metaphysics. <laughs> yeah, that's helpful. So I think it's helpful seeing um, your objections here. And like, so Pliny is trying to get at like the question about like reliability of your beliefs, given naturalism. And he wants to say the probability is low, um, that if naturalism is true, like you're going to come to these different beliefs. Um, and what you want to say is like, well, it's not necessarily a problem that like the probability might not be super high because like we just like we can't have that kind of certainty. What exactly are you getting at here? That's so, so, OK, so I'm arguing that 
Um, first of all, we know that the probability that we're reliable at metaphysics is minuscule. Oh, second, second uh, that's not a problem for people who want to go on holding metaphysical beliefs so long as you're not too dogmatic. I mean, if mm. you were certain in all of your metaphysical beliefs, then there's a problem, right? Okay. There's an argument here against dogmatism. But there's no argument here against the kind of se sensible fallibilism, somebody who's giving moderate probabilities, enough for belief, but not ridiculously high probabilities to their metaphysical beliefs. They, it's perfectly consistent with their holding um, those metaphysical beliefs with the probabilities that they do, that they think that we're unreliable, that when we that when we do metaphysical theorizing, a lot of the time we're not hitting the truth. Okay, yeah. And so it, it doesn't stop you from holding the particular beliefs because that other judgment was a kind of collective one. Taking them all together, I'm sure I've got lots of false metaphysical beliefs, but ask me about any of my metaphysical beliefs and I'll say, well, you know, it's controversial, but, you know, this is the way I lean. So I mean, if you ask for numbers, I'm not going to give them, but, you know, you could say like I'm kind of 65% certain that there are no abstract objects, something like that. Mm -hmm. right? So long as my okay. believing is like that, I'm going to be fine. There's, yeah. there's not going to be a planting a style objection. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's super helpful. Um, let's keep on rolling. We have two more arguments uh, to get through. The next one comes from, I believe it's Victor Reppert. Um, What does he say about the argument for a reason? And what are your thoughts about it, Graham? So, so he thinks that according to naturalism, um, beliefs are fully explained in terms of non-natural, um, sorry, non-rational causes. Right. Mm. So this is just another version of the kind of reductionist picture that I and or re, no, reductionist and anti-identity theory picture that I just want to reject. Yeah. I think that um, part of a, a lot of the time when we explain beliefs, we explain them in terms of rational causes, right? It was rational for me to believe that there was a tree there because I saw that it was a tree and recognised that it was a tree, mm -hmm. right? Um, and those rationalise the belief. Uh, and if you're an identity theorist and you're not a reductionist, then there's no difficulty that emerges. So that's what I... So I think of the, the rapid argument as being very similar um, to... Um, some of the arguments that we've already discussed. And I, yeah. I think that the response by this stage should be kind of predictable. <laughs> yeah. So Repert, he's kind of going like with a Lewis style argument um, where he's saying that like naturalism means that like our beliefs come from a non-rational process, which he thinks is like a very big problem for like rationality. And what you want to say, Graham, is like like being an identity theorist where, say, like your brain states are just your mental states, if I'm right about that. Um, evolution really doesn't have any problem with explaining like how we could have some sort of like rationality from a non-rational like process. No, so, so there's – I mean, we haven't really talked about this, but there's a story about the evolution of rationality um, mm -hmm. uh, and – uh, the ways in which um, we get to be rational decision makers. And, and this doesn't just apply to us. It applies to all kinds of other animals too that have some measure of reason and are able to do certain kinds of reasoning tasks successfully, right? Um, and there's kind of ev evolutionary explanation of why we should think that these creatures, well, well it's, it's not surprising that there's a whole lot of creatures that have, to some extent or another, have developed capacities for reason. So I'm thinking about um, other primates, but also um, birds, some other mammals as well. There's quite a lot of reasoning that goes on. Right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. so that's, yeah. 
Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for that, Graham. Um, so here we go. One more argument. We started with Balfour way back in 1879. And here we are with William Hasker in 2013. Um, what is his argument from rationality? And like, what do you think about it? Okay, so his argument's quite different. He and um, so I wrote this paper um, for a fest trip for Hasker. So there were a whole lot of people writing stuff about Hasker's views about various things, and he and then he replies to all of them. So there's a, a whole um, issue of a journal devoted to this. And um, Hasker is not, I mean, <laughs> Hasker's not worried about the combination of evolutionary theory and naturalism. He's just worried about naturalism. The point I make, the kind of, it's, uh, the way that I kind of tied all of this together was thinking of all of these things as being objections to naturalism, but some of them take it in particular that evolutionary naturalism is the target. But naturalists generally are committed to evolutionary theory, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and certainly if you object to naturalism, then you object to the combination of evolutionary theory and naturalism. Right. So, so Hasko thinks that um, he, he, he's not worried, he's not worried about evolutionary theory. So he's not, he's definitely not running the kind of argument that Plantinga runs and he's not running the kind of argument that Taylor runs and he's not running the kind of argument that Lewis is running. It's a kind of different argument. And what he thinks is that there's naturalists end up being committed to a kind of pre-established harmony between um, certain kinds of neural states and certain kinds of phenomenal states. So you can think of this argument as being more in the ballpark of things like um, Jackson's Mary argument or Chalmers zombie argument or um, arguments like that. It's a, a kind of worry about um, <laughs> the connection between how things seem or the qualitative feel of experience or something like that and the kind of stuff that's going on in brains, right? What he does, or what it seemed to me what he, what he did um, in the discussion in the particular article that I was focusing on, because he also has... I mean, he has a book about this topic as well as various articles, and I pick one to focus on. What, what he does is, he, I think, he just ignores the possibility of identity theory, right? Mm. He ignores yeah. the view that says that, um, <laughs> right, that, that mental states just are brain states. And so, of course, um, <laughs> if that's right, um, my it's seeming to me that things are a certain way just is my having certain kinds of um, you know, yeah. processing going on. And so there's no need for any pre-established harmony or anything like that. Identity theory never needs pre-established harmony. When, so, I mean, pick a different example, um, lightning and electricity, right? It's not that there's some pre-established harmony between lightning and uh, electricity. It's just that um, there's electric discharges between clouds. That's just what lightning is, right? And so, so that was the that's the kind of gist of the discussion mm. of of Hasker's view in the article. Yeah, it's funny because I was just like I was trying to I've been trying to jot down notes. Um, and like you're talking about Hasker and you're like, he's worried about naturalism and like the harmony of like these neural states and these phenomenal states. And I'm like, well, well, Graham's an identity theorist. Is he just going to bring that up? And I mean, I mean, it makes sense. Like, it, like, it seems like if you have this, like, you think there's a worry between neural states and phenomenal states and someone wants to come around and say like, Hey, well, like, what if they're just like 
identical, then like that would kind of go away with that problem if identity theory would work. Right. So Hasker's reply was that he has other reasons for thinking that identity theory doesn't work. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, Do we, have a whole we don't. We, we don't. We, we don't need to to go into that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, and I do think that uh, there's the the position the the kind of identity theory that I like um, went out of fashion for a long time, but there are definitely people working in philosophy of mind who are kind of interested in kind of trying to reinflate it, right? Mm-hmm. Get, it up, get it up and running again. Uh, and that's where my sympathies lie. Yeah. Well, Graham, this has been super interesting, and it'd be cool to just talk about identity. identity. <laughs> Why can't I say identity? Identity theory sometime. Um, do you have any, like, with regards to, like, today and today's conversation before we wrap up, do you have any, like, last thoughts or things you want to say about, like, the arguments from reason and, like, the history we've looked at today? Um, so I, I guess kind of looking back, uh, it's, it's, I mean, th- these different arguments that we've been talking about are only kind of very loosely connected to one another. I mean, they're mm-hmm. kind of loosely connected to the idea that, um, we have reason, right? And that somehow or other our having reason, um, seems not to be expected or mysterious if naturalism or naturalism and evolutionary theory are true. But there's a lot of diversity in exactly what the problems here are supposed to be. And there's kind of different resources that I think someone who's a friend of naturalism and evolutionary theory would draw on in responding to different arguments. So some of them, I want to go identity theory, but I leave it open. We haven't discussed this, whether naturalists who are not identity theorists could take some different route, right? Um, I just decided as a policy that I would go with what I believed in this paper and just appeal to identity theory and point out that it, it's it, it, it's not like it's off the table. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another thing completely different related to, I think, to the paradox of the preface that um, is uh, uh, ha- can give you grounds for rejecting, for example, Belfer's argument and Plantinga's argument. There's a third thing about, um, and again, this is related to Belfer and to Plantinga, as well as maybe to some of the others. There's a third thing about um, certainty and whether somehow or other you've got to have foundational beliefs and they've got to be certain, right? I mean, that picture I want to reject. Um, I don't think that you want to have both of those things. Certainly not if you're understanding foundations in something like the sense of axia. Uh, And there's one other thing I wanted to say, which is about Taylor's argument, because Taylor's argument, I think, is entirely distinctive, but it kind of runs, conflates, on the one hand, some things being evidence for something else and something being a conduit of information of a certain kind, right? And that, that, once you see that that's what's going on, it really feels to me like his argument just completely falls apart. Anyway, mm. so that's that. So there isn't really like that. That they were four or five very different objections. So it's not like there's a kind of family of things and there's a single objection here that covers all of them. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you for that, Graham. Um, this has been a really good conversation. I've enjoyed it greatly. Um, how can people like follow you, connect with you, things like that, if they want to hear more of what you're doing um, beyond this? Um, hmm. I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> um, so, because I, mean, I, I do conversations like this a reasonable amount, mm-hmm. but that's kind of about, it, right. I publish I publish stuff in philosophical journals and then I do these kinds of conversations. I have a Twitter account, I have a Facebook account, but I'm 
I hardly ever post on either of them. So it's not like you're going to get regular updates about what I think from any <laughs> other source than just kind of checking YouTube from time to time and seeing if there's something new that's come mm -hmm. up there. Uh, of course, I can recommend my books and my papers. Uh, if you want to know about my papers, the best place to go is to the Phil Papers site where most of my stuff is archived and accessible. So um, Phil Papers allows you to um, upload kind of pre publication versions of your papers and you can find pre-publication versions of my papers there. For the books, they're not at Phil Papers. Um, there you kind of need a public library or a university library or something like that to get access mm -hmm. to, to yeah. them. Um, and the earlier books are not that easy to read, uh, especially um, I think arguing about gods is pretty hard slog it doesn't mean that i'm saying you shouldn't try but you might <laughs> prefer you but you might prefer to read i mean it, for one thing it's extremely long um you might um you might prefer to read some of my shorter papers before you try there and uh i think um that my ability to actually write stuff that's accessible to non-specialists has improved a little bit over time. And so my more recent books, books like Atheism, The Basics and Naturalism and Religion, are probably, which, is, um, but which is where I give my treatment of planting as evolutionary argument against naturalism. Um, those are better places to start than the earlier books. Mm. Well, I encourage people to check out anything that Graham suggests. Um, I think your debate with Kenny Pierce, there's a great kind of introduction to like your view as an atheist, um, kind of overlaying everything and how it kind of helps impact how you think about everything. So yeah, all kinds of great stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten about that one. I should reckon <laughs> that's, that's the most recent one. And what I was doing was talking about the kind of three most recent, two, well, two of the three most recent ones, but I definitely should have mentioned that one as well. So thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, Graham, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, really value your time. And I thank everyone for listening today. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff if you like it here in Apologetics and what we're doing. Um, and yeah, if you value what we do, go consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash it here in Apologetics. Graham, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. And there's so much to think about here with the argument from Reason. So thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. Have a good one, everyone. And God bless. We'll catch you next time.